and plenty of time to indulge in his favourite intellectual pastimes, which were wide even for the time. He devised a plan for reunifying the Protestant and Roman Catholic churches, a proposal for France to conquer Egypt, and contributions to philosophy and logic which are still highly rated today. He wrote all these letters. I mean, it, that's yeah. absolutely extraordinary. Yeah. I, I, he must have cloned himself. I can't believe there was just <laughs> one Leibniz. You know. But Leibniz was not just a man of words. He was also one of the first people to invent practical calculating machines that worked on the binary system, true forerunners of the computer. 300 years later, the engineering department at Leibniz University here in Hanover have put them together following Leibniz's blueprint. I love all the ball bearings. So these are going to be our zeros and ones. So a ball bearing is a one. Only zeros and one. Yeah. Now we represent the number 127. In binary, it means that we have the first seven digits in one. Yeah. And now I give in one uh, number one. Okay. So now we add 127 plus one. Yeah. It's 128, which is two power eight. Oh, okay. So there's going to be lots of action. Would you Would you show this here? So this is the money shot. So we're going to add one. Oh, here we go. They're all carrying. So This is 128. This is 2 power 8. Excellent. So 127 in binary is 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, which is all the all bearings here. To add one, we need th it all gets carried. So this goes to 0, 0, 0, 0, and we have a power of Excellent. 2 here. So right. this, is, this mechanism gets yeah. rid of all the ball bearings that you don't yeah. need. I it's like pinball, mathematical pinball. Exactly. I, I, I love this machine. After a hard day's work, Leibniz often came here, the famous gardens of Herrenhausen, now in the middle of Hanover, but then on the outskirts of the city. Something about mathematics and walking. I don't know, you've been working at your desk all day or morning on some problem and your head's all fuzzy and you just need to come and have a walk. You let your subconscious mind kind of take over and sometimes you get your breakthrough just uh, looking at the trees or whatever. I certainly had some of my best ideas whilst walking my local park. So I'm hoping to get a little bit of inspiration here on Leibniz's uh, local stomping ground. I didn't get the chance to purge my mind of mathematical challenges because in the years since Leibniz lived here, someone has built a maze. Well, there is a mathematical formula for getting out of a maze, which is if you put your left hand on the side of the maze and just keep it there, keep on winding round, you eventually get out. That's the theory, at least. Let's see whether it works. Leibniz had no such distractions. Within five years, he'd worked out the details of the calculus, seemingly independent from Newton, although he knew about Newton's work. But unlike Newton, Leibniz was quite happy to make his work known. And so mathematicians across Europe heard about the calculus first from him and not from Newton. And that's when all the trouble started. Throughout mathematical history, there have been lots of priority disputes and arguments may seem a little bit petty and schoolboyish, but we really want our name to be on that theorem. This is our one chance for a little bit of immortality, because that theorem's going to last forever. And that's why we dedicate so much time to trying to crack these things. And somehow we can't believe that somebody else has got it at the same time as us. These are our theorems, our babies, our children, and we don't want to share the credit. Back in London, Newton certainly didn't want to share credit with Leibniz, who he thought of as a Hanoverian upstart. After years of acrimony and accusation, the Royal Society in London was asked to adjudicate between the rival claims. The Royal Society gave Newton credit for the first discovery of the calculus and Leibniz credit for the first publication. But in their final judgment, they accused Leibniz of plagiarism. However, that might have had something to do with the fact that the report was written by their president, one Sir Isaac Newton. Leibniz was incredibly hurt. He admired Newton and never really recovered. He died in 1716. Newton lived on another 11 years and was buried in the grandeur of Westminster Abbey. Leibniz's memorial, by contrast, is here in this small church in Hanover. The irony is, that it's Leibniz's mathematics which eventually triumphs, not Newton's. I'm a big Leibniz fan. 
quite often revolutions in mathematics are about producing the right language to capture a new vision. And that's what Leibniz was so good at. Leibniz's notation, his way of writing the calculus, captured its true spirit. It's still the one we use in maths today. Newton's notation was for many mathematicians clumsy and difficult to use. And so while British mathematics loses its way a little, the story of maths switches to the very heart of Europe, Basel. In its heyday in the 18th century, the free city of Basel in Switzerland was the commercial hub of the entire Western world. Around this maelstrom of trade, there developed a tradition of learning, particularly learning which connected with commerce. And one family summed all this up. It's kind of curious. Artists often have children who are artists. Musicians, their children, are often musicians. But us mathematicians? Our children don't tend to be mathematicians. I'm not sure why it is. At least that's my view, although others dispute it. What no one disagrees with is there is one great dynasty of mathematicians, the Bernoullis. In the 18th and 19th centuries, they produced half a dozen outstanding mathematicians, any of whom we'd have been proud to have had in Britain. And they all came from Basel. You might have great minds like Newton and Leibniz who make these fundamental breakthroughs, but you also need the disciples who take that message, clarify it, realise its implications, and then spread it wide. The family were originally merchants, and this is one of their houses. It's now part of the University of Basel, and it's been completely refurbished, apart from one room, which has been kept very much as the family would have used it. Dr Fritz Nagel, keeper of the Bernoulli archive, has promised to show it to me. If we can find it. No, we are on the wrong floor. Wrong floor, OK. Wrong floor. Right. <laughs> Sorry. Look, uh, are these free apples? We can take an apple? No, wrong mathematician. Eventually, we got there. So this is where the Bernoullis would have done some of their mathematics? Uh, yes. Of an evening. I was really just being polite. I'm not sure we should have bothered. The only thing of interest was an old stove. Now, of the Bernoullis, which is your favourite? Uh, yes. Favorite also, my favourite Bernoulli is Johann Wadden. He is the most um, smart mathematician. Uh -huh. Perhaps n his brother Jakob was the, deep, uh, the mathematician with the deeper insight in the problems, mm -hmm. but Johann found elegant solutions. The brothers didn't like each other much, but both worshipped Leibniz. They corresponded with him, stood up for him against Newton's allies, and spread his calculus throughout Europe. Leibniz was very happy to found two gifted mathematicians outside of his personal circle of friends yeah. who mastered his calculus and could distribute it in the scientific community. That was very important for Leibniz. Yeah. And important for maths, too. Without the Bernoullis, it would have taken much longer for calculus to become what it is today, a cornerstone of mathematics. At least that is Dr Nagel's contention, and he's a great Bernoulli fan. Tonight, he's arranged for me to meet Professor Daniel Bernoulli, the latest member of the family, whose famous name ensures he gets some very odd emails. which I got was, uh, uh, Professor Bernoulli, can you give me a hand with calculus? Yes, exactly, to find a Bernoulli, then you expect them to be able to do some calculus. But this Daniel Bernoulli is a professor of geology. The maths gene seems to have truly died out. And during our very hearty dinner, I found myself wandering back to maths. It's a bit unfair on the Bernoullis to describe them simply as disciples of Leibniz. One of their many great contributions to mathematics was to develop the calculus to solve a classic problem of the day. Imagine a ball rolling down a ramp. The task is to design a ramp that will get the ball from the top to the bottom in the fastest time possible. You might think that a straight ramp would be quickest, or possibly a curved one like this that gives the ball plenty of downward momentum. In fact, it's neither of these. Calculus shows that it's what we call a cycloid, the path traced by a point on the rim of a moving bicycle wheel. This application of the calculus by the Bernoullis, which became known as the calculus of variation, has become one of the most powerful aspects of the mathematics of Leibniz and Newton. Investors use it to maximise profits. Engineers exploit it to minimise energy use. Designers apply it to optimise construction. It has now become one of the linchpins of our modern technological world. 
Meanwhile, things were getting more interesting in the restaurant. Yes. My second surprise, uh, it includes Mr. Leonard Euler. Leonard Euler. Daniel Bernoulli. Leonard Euler, one of the most famous names in mathematics. This Leonard is a descendant of the original Leonard Euler star pupil of Johann Bernoulli. I'm the ninth generation and the fourth Leonhard in our family after Leonhard Euler the first, the mathematician. Okay, and yourself, are you a mathematician? Actually, I'm a business analyst. I can study mathematician with uh, my name. I Everyone will expect you to <laughs> prove the Riemann hypothesis. <laughs> Perhaps it's just as well that Leonard decided not to follow in the footsteps of his illustrious ancestor. He'd have had a lot to live up to. I'm going in a boat across the Rhine, and I must say I'm feeling a little bit worse for wear this morning. Last night's dinner with uh, Mr. Euler and Professor Bernoulli uh, degenerated into toasts to all the theorems that the Bernoullis and Eulers had proved, and by God, they've proved quite a lot of them. Never again. I was getting disapproving glances from my fellow passengers as well. Luckily, it was only a short trip. Not like the trip that Euler took in 1728 to start a new life. Euler may have been the prodigy of Johann Bernoulli, but there was no room for him in the city. If your name wasn't Bernoulli, then there was little chance of getting a job in mathematics here in Basel. But Daniel, the son of Johann Bernoulli, was a great friend of Euler and managed to get him a job at his university. But to get there would take seven weeks, because Daniel's university was...